thank you very much. Yes, I am the senior product manager responsible for 5G and IoT products in Gilat. And uh, as uh, it was mentioned, I have a lot of experience both in 5G and IoT. And it has been a very interesting journey for me to, to look into what satellite, uh, you know, and the integration between satellite and 5G through the standards, through different uh, activities that we're doing in Gila through different, you know, test beds and POCs. And uh, uh, what I want to share with you right now, it's uh, first of all, you know, a review on the different standards, where do we stand? and uh, what in my opinion are the, the opportunities and challenges in this area and of course we'll be more than happy to answer any question <clears throat> so from introductory perspective you know 5g non-standalone started in uh, release 15 and uh, release 15 and 16 have been you know the first phases of 6g and now we are in release 17 and uh, but also besides you know the the definition of standalone and non-standalone architectures that have been defined in these releases also a lot of work uh, uh, on ntn has been done like uh, the, the definition of connectivity architectures use case descriptions and link budget models for ntn already you can find in release 15 and 16 besides other work that has been done by the eu and other bodies uh, like uh, things such as sat 5g and sat 5 and so forth sat 5g was it was interesting because it defined also the sweet spots where uh, satellite and 5g really you know conjugate best together now we are in the midst of release 17 which is estimated freeze is september 22 it might be delayed it was delayed because of covid it might be delayed a little but basically we're talking about you know the end of uh, next year and then release 18 will build upon that incrementally as every release is going to do that. Uh, towards the end of uh, this uh, decade, we are going to talk, start talking about uh, 6G. There's going to, there's going to be uh, a, um, a standard called IMT 2030, which is coming from the ITUT, uh, from the International Telecommunication Union. And uh, the same way that the IMT 2020 was the one that in 2015 laid down the, uh, the vision for 5G, so it's the same. Each one of those IMT uh, documents basically lays the vision towards the next generation of technologies. And 6G is talking about uh, uh, the concept of a 3D network, which I'm going to explain in the next uh, slides. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the uh, industry is not waiting, and that's happened in many, many cases, uh, where uh, an early players are already appearing in the horizon. We see AST, Link, Omnispace, and others that are, you know, uh, providing you know proof of feasibility towards whether a, a user a, you know a user equipment like a class 3 phone can really you know connect to, to um, through a leo and what type of services can be done through that connection what is interesting and i think that also had this has been mentioned uh, very clearly in the last presentation is the the fact that uh, we are not just talking about radio there are several very important architectural constructs that characterize the later versions of 4g and of course 5g and they are making their way already into the satellite communications but i would say that without this it's going to be very difficult to do the full integration and of course i'm talking about software defined networking you know which is the disaggregation and the separation between control and user plane what's called cups and then the network function virtualization the 5g core today it's already defined as a cnf as a cloud native function so dish networks put you know their cloud uh, the 5g core in aws so we have that as well. And MANO, which is basically management and orchestration. You have to have visibility. If you want, for instance, to provide a slice end-to-end, -end, you have to have visibility end-to-end, -end, which means that you have to have integration through APIs, a standard APIs towards you know, a slice manager or an orchestration like ONAP or things like that in order basically to have full visibility, especially when you're talking about multi-RAT uh, type of connectivity, which is basically different radio access technologies. You are connecting terrestrial, and then you have another complementary uh, uh, you know, connection through a satellite, or maybe two satellites at different orbits and things like that. And then you need to define you know, which type of, of connectivity goes through which type of connection based on uh, different types of slices, different type of latencies, requirements, quality of service, and so forth. So in order to be able to do that, you have to have that vision. If not, that will be basically impossible. Now, we are in release 17 right now, and release 17 is dealing with NTN, which is basically mainly satellite and hubs, high altitude platforms, but they 
also dealing with other very interesting things such as multicast, which I think it's a very important thing that satellites can do. Satellites can do SOTA and FOTA, basically software over the air and firmware over the air. They can, uh, you know, feed CDNs, uh, content-defined networks, and they can do this very, very efficiently. And this is one of the sweet spots that has been defined, you know, in the conjunction between 5G and satellites. Also, another very interesting one is new, ra uh, new radio light, which is also called red cap reduced capabilities, which is a kind of an in-between between EMBB and uh, LTE category M. Basically, when, when you are needing more bandwidth for several use cases that are more than what you're usually using in LP1 in low power wide area networks, but they are less than EMBB. They are still consumer type of IoT uh, uh, use cases, and those are... Uh, uh, they are being defined as well. So it's not just about end to end. There are also things which are, you know, in parallel that are also going to contribute to that integration between the satellite world and the 5G world. Uh, <clears throat> so we see here that release 17 is going to be frozen in September 22. Uh, preliminary work on re release 18 is it's being done basically today. And there is a lot of end to end content. I'm, I'm part of some of the, this activity. It's very interesting. And uh, uh, then we are going to talk about release 18, 19, 20, and 6G towards, you know, of course, the end of the the end of uh, the decade. Now, if we look at this, and I really like this uh, uh, slide from Euroscom, is that uh, what is the end goal of 3GPP? Why bother with this exercise? It's basically seamless integration of MTN with the rest. So if somebody asks me, do you think that, uh, you know, satellite... Uh, uh, 5G satellites are going to be there and be there to stay. Yes, it's going to be a journey. It's not going to be tomorrow, but I believe that if you really want to do, you know, end-to-end -end type of uh, management orchestration, and if you really want to, you know, impose all those, uh, uh, you know, things such as MANO and SDN and NFV, you, and have this full visibility in multi-RAT type of environment, you have to have this. So it's not going to come, but we see a journey here. We see milestones. And now you have the, the, the presentation, you will be able to look through them. But I think that some of the things are already being done today, those architectural constructs, as I was mentioning, but other things are going to be done in the future. Of course, we have satellites in the sky today, so it's not that we're going to replace them one with the other tomorrow, but there is a process, and I believe in that process. Um, now, the concept of uh, 6G, we're talking about the 3D networks, and here it becomes really interesting because they're even going to talk about undersea sensors, you know, sensors at the bed of the ocean, which kind of the opposite of uh, space. We are talking about, you know, submergibles, we are talking about undersea sensors, we're going to talk about buoys, think about seismic sensors, think about, you know, a barocline sensors, things about, you know, uh, density sensors, temperature sensors, and God knows what probably they are. 20 more that I even haven't thought about them. And then terrestrial networks, and then everything with, you know, between the troposphere and the stratosphere, whether UAVs and HAPs and drones, healthy to drones, and then, of course, the space, LEO, MEO, GEO, HEO, and so forth. And the idea is that the, the 3D network is a fully orchestrated, you know, 3D kind of construct where you will be able, you know, everything is going to be connected to everything. You will be able, you know, to backhaul maybe your HAPs connection through the GEO, and, and you will be able to orchestrate all these type of communication. So that's kind of the end goal towards 6G. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the, at the standards and you look at, at the places where satellites can connect, there are basically two places. One is direct access, which is perhaps one of the most interesting ones. You take a UE, which can be a category three UE, your handheld or a category two UE, what you put on your car or other UEs. It can be, you know, an IoT card, uh, you know, transmitting 5G. And what type of, you know, type of connection it can be done with a satellite, whether the satellite is a regular pen pipe or whether some part of the G node B, it's within the satellite, whether it's a distributed unit or the full uh, G node B. And this one is a very heavy area of focus of release 17. There is another area which I think it's also very interesting, which is the what's called the indirect <coughs> connection, which encompasses the classic cellular backhaul, but also something which is called relay backhaul, which I'm going to talk a little more in detail in the next slides. And also, you can do transport or, or backhaul, if you like, between the MEC and the core. Here we have the 5G core with all the different functions, access management functions, session management functions, policy control functions, etc. You have the different interfaces, <coughs> and either you do the backhaul from the RAN, 
uh, through basically uh, a classic uh, VSAT or a relay, uh, or you connect, uh, you know, the core, if you have a local breakout into your uh, specific uh, local uh, uh, MEC, then you can do things through the N9 interface and the N04 interface. So it really depends what you want to do, what is the specific architecture and so forth. Um, now, if we go to the direct uh, direct UE access through satellite, then we have two options. Either it's going to be a bent pipe satellite and then you have your UE, which can again, can be a class three. It's basically your regular handset. What can be done here? So direct connection usually it's for IoT, broadcast entertainment for cars, public safety and so forth. Interestingly, if you put, you know, a, a, a strong enough UE there in a car, for instance, can you do SOTA and FOTA? Can you do multicast and things like that? So there are certain things that are being investigated. These are, of course, depending on, on the uh, link here. But there are certain things that have been, for instance, IoT, it's certainly something that would be able to be done. And then you have the other option, which is basically having a G node B. Usually it's going to be a part of the G node B. Let's say the distributed unit, the centralized unit is going to be on the ground. And then you're going through a regenerative satellite that can connect to another satellite, perhaps through an XN interface, which is the interface between two G node Bs. So there are very interesting options opening here. Now, <clears throat> the relay, which I think it's also very, very interesting, is basically you have a UE connecting through 5G new radio, the UU interface to basically another G node B, and then you have a relay node here that is again connecting through new radio to uh, uh, this G node B, and this G node B is called the donor node. And basically, so you have two, GUE, two, two G node Bs, one here and one here. And of course, the G node B can be part of the satellite. And the nice thing about it is that you have a relay node here can be an aggregation point where one relay node can basically connect to multiple UEs, aggregate the data, and then send it through a 5G new radio interface towards uh, uh, the ground. Um, here we see this in more detail. We have several UEs connecting to a relay, connecting through a satellite into the core. And this is drawing from the terrestrial uh, IAB concept, which stands for integrated access backhaul, where you have two UEs, uh, we have two G node B, sorry, and they are connected through a specific beam. Uh, one is the, the one that's connected, and the other is the donor that is receiving, you know, the relayed information and then connected to the CU and then to the core. So it's the same concept, but put in the sky. And this is a very powerful concept in my opinion, because you will be able to aggregate a lot of data. Let's say for instance, a private 5G network with a MEC, and then you want to go to the satellite, you can go basically a real life 5G and then into the core. Uh, <clears throat> MEC was mentioned. I think that MEC it's incredibly important because uh, you know Vodafone is talking about a million private networks until the end of the decade. So you have a lot of LTE networks, private LTE networks. You have a lot of private 5G networks. Less 5G because the ecosystem is not yet there, but it's going to be. And then you're going to do a transport, you know, of the data that you will have in your local uh, uh, multi-access edge computing, the MEC, which can be caching, which can be application functions and other. And then your user plane function here will talk with the user plane function at the core through the N9 interface. And of course, it can be a central cache talking with a localized cache for doing things such as caching and prefetching and so forth. So this is also a very interesting architecture. Now, here we see very clearly the need for orchestration. I mean, we usually think about uh, satellites as being, you know, uh, 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 communications in areas where you don't have any other choice. You don't have fiber, you don't have microwave, you don't have this, you don't have that, put the satellite. But actually there are also uh, uh, use cases now being brought up about satellites also being connection connected in semi-rural or even rural areas or, or, or sorry, urban areas. And the reason for that is that you can, it can be complementary. You can have a lot of load in this uh, uh, link and then you can just, you know, put a lot of things here or you want to multicast content and satellite is a great tool for doing that. So by doing this type of connectivity and then you have to decide through an SDN logic or an orchestrated logic, what you are going to, you know, send through the, through the terrestrial network and what you are going to send through the satellite network, you have to have full visibility to both paths. And that will lead, uh, you know, to full transparency and eventually also to interoperability, which is something that I believe that is going to be a positive 
out and basically outcome of this long-term process so you can basically connect to two different satellites at two different orbits you can connect to two different satellites which, which have g node b components and then you can do handover through the xn interface and there are very interesting <clears throat> you know variants that uh, uh, they will cater to specific use cases some of them we might not be even see today which does not necessarily mean that they're not going to happen right i mean usually when 3gpp comes into a place and and, and defines certain you know standards for uh, uh, technologies usually things happen i remember very clearly the case of cdma when there was you know cdma and wideband cdma 3g from the cdma side and 3dma from the 3bpp side and after 10 years you don't see cdma happening anywhere even though they have a great uh, you know roadmap of the evdo cdma 2000 evdo Revay, rev b and things like that boom they disappeared why because 3GPP came and defined the 3G UHSPA, UMTS, uh, wideband CDMA, and so forth. So I'm not saying that this is going to necessarily happen here because it's a different, uh, you know, scenario. But I say that the minute that the 3GPP is coming and, and you know, taking the time to define standards, uh, something will happen afterwards. And uh, we basically need to, to be aware of that. It's not happening tomorrow, but in my opinion, is something that you know towards 25 26 we're going to see more and more whenever the technology matures more usually it takes between one year to one year and a half after a, a standard is defined until you start seeing technological maturity based on, on on compliance to what has been defined in that specific standard from gilat and this is my last slide the gilat is uh, uh, very ready to to 5g basically we have done 5g with customers we're doing 5g with customers the backhaul cellular backhaul we have uh, uh, you know uh, implemented all the different quality of service adaptations to to cater to the specific requirements of 5g control and user plane we have you know a, a cloud-based architecture and uh, uh, the idea is that this is a great uh, uh, you know uh, um, place to start our journey into the more uh, you know evolved stages of 5g and end-to-end -end, the integration between 5g and end-to-end -end, as will be defined by release 17 and 18 and we have done this both for nsa and sa architectures and tested things such as volte and uh, drone control and uh, uh, you know video and all these different types of uh, applications so we truly believe that this is a a, a path that we need to be very very you know attent attentive to and uh, uh, basically uh, you know move forward with 3gpp together thank you very much okay thank you Dan thank you uh, daniel and again we hear this point of uh, satellite um being useful as an urban solution not just uh, in its usual role as a rural solution um, and this is something that we're hearing more and more about at, on all of these programs. Luke, Luke, questions? Yes, thank you. So this was a very interesting presentation to see all the uh, possibilities of orchestrating satellite inside the telco ecosystem. So I, I was wondering if we can take a slightly different point of view here and, and, and and see into that from an MNO point of view. There are some similar questions here coming from the audience. So, uh, I mean, what's the willingness of MNOs to adopt satellite for their operations? Okay, I think that uh, this is a very, very good question. I mean, usually until now, the, the, the MNOs had like a checklist. Can I do fiber? Yes. Can I do microwave? Yes. Can I do this? Yes. Oh, I cannot do A, B, C, D. Okay. I do satellite because satellite is it's uh, perhaps, you know, but now with these new use cases, I think that satellite is moving up, you know, the value chain in a point that, uh, as you said, we might find satellite in, in urban, uh, you know, environment. Because um, if you think about, for instance, take the, 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 the concept of multicasting, right? I mean, connected cars. You want to now download software uh, to a connected car, and you can do that to a roadside unit, in, uh, and then you can, you know, do it through the V2I, the vehicle to infrastructure uh, link. You can basically upload the software in a car, 
or you want to upload telemetry in a car which is in the middle of nowhere and suddenly you know that the, the engine is going to die because uh, some OBD code, uh, you know, onboard diagnostic code is being sent from the car. These are things that, uh, you know, the satellite is very good to do in that besides being a complementary, uh, you know, very good in case of, of load. I mean, if you're talking about all these private networks, right? which I see everywhere. We are working with private networks and they're really, you know, everywhere, ports, airports, cities, schools, and many, many other things. And, and then you say, okay, what's happening right now? I, I'm basically creating hotspots of, of a lot of data consumption in many, many places. Some of these data consumptions is remaining on site, on-prem, because you have a mech there doing local analytics, like video analytics. And then the only thing that you are moving backwards is perhaps, you know, low level video streaming and some information for, you know, the machine learning in the core and things like that. But still, you need to have this information. There are private uh, networks in, 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 in uh, ships today where basically if you have a narrow band IoT container, you know, a, a, a reefer, a container with a frozen um, a produce or with vaccines or anything, and then you have 10,000 of them in a big container ship, and all of them need to connect, you know, to a single place where it's going to be aggregated. It's, it's also a mech where you have to do local analytics, and then you have from one single place, you can shoot it to the satellite. So what I'm saying is that uh, this new... Uh, uh, private networks, whether it's 4G or 5G, these new architectures, uh, you know, are creating a multitude of new use cases where I think that satellite it has an advantage uh, in order to, to be there as a valuable asset, as a valuable contributor, as a valuable enabler to these type of use cases. And some of these use cases also can be done, it can be found in, uh, uh, in urban areas, definitely. So I, in, in that sense, I'm very optimistic for all the community of satellite providers, which I think that there is a new, you know, set of use cases brewing, which might actually bring us forward in the value chain, which I think it's important. Good. So, yeah, let's hope the satellite can play a bigger role in the telco ecosystem in the coming years with 5G. Thank you. Back to you, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.